the headless horseman here it's may the 20th 2024 this is the first video in uh, i think maybe one or two weeks first off i was away for deutsche gold messe and uh, yeah when when i got home shortly after i got home i got sick so for a few days there I was really down and uh, you can probably hear on my voice right now that i'm i'm still uh a bit under the weather but a lot better and uh, also i mean since markets have been performing quite well it hasn't really been the need to provide copium videos and uh, i actually kind of like look forward to this maybe finally being able to take a break from i was saying buy low uh because now the lows might be behind us. Anyway, thanks for the thanks to the sponsors. So today silver is actually ripping. I think it's the highest price it's been in I don't know 11 years or something. So things are moving gold around all-time highs. I think copper is hit an all-time high. I think actually a lot of the Commodities are doing okay. Zinc is about 3,000. No, nickel is actually above 21,000. Yeah, and of course here you see copper at, I guess that's 11,000 pound or something per ton. Uh, so basically it looks like we're, uh, we have a bull market in metals across the board. Kind of, yeah, I mean, look at this gold candle. <clears throat> and of course what i've been saying for what it feels like to be an eternity now uh we don't know what's gonna kick it off we don't know when it's gonna get kicked off but we know the juniors are going to uh start a bull market again and then people all of a sudden will come back and more and more people will buy the higher they go. Um, yeah, and that, that's how it is. I mean, fast or rewind, I was going to say, like, what's that? Like two, two, three months? It was death out there. Nobody gave two shits, almost. Nobody was really talking on Twitter. There were a few who actually bought low. And, and my point with, uh, uh, with what I've said a bunch of times, I'd rather average down and take, I mean, take Defiance, for example. I just, po I just posted this on April the 19th when we had a, uh, you know, I used this as a proxy again. You could have used Bear Creek Mining, but this is actually has been... Uh, Bear Creek mining has been killed so much so it kind of threw the chart off let's say. Defiance actually has basically retraced to the exact same price point uh, for the third time. Here was I think 2000, 2016, 2020 and 2024. And this was what I posted and I say I, I know a lot of people or I heard from a lot of people on Twitter it's like nope uh, I'm waiting juniors are gonna put in another low this is just a false start again which I've also been saying for I don't know how long that everybody will always assume that uh, there's gonna be the last dip another dip nobody's gonna believe uh, you know after a long bear nobody's actually gonna believe that this time is it so because they've been used to so many fake rallies uh, and my opinion has always been it doesn't really matter uh, if you get down to these extreme, extremely low levels, just averaging down works every single time in the commodity space. As long as the company is around, it's going to bounce back. I mean, on average, I'm not saying that every single company is the same kind of buy. I'm just saying that where I have been saying that it doesn't matter when you get to extreme levels. I mean, here it's like one... Over a year. I mean, even if one started buying here, just averaging down, averaging down, what happened 
afterwards and again a lot of people thought this was a fake rally and I just showed that well after the first leg up the two previous times it retraced it consolidated then the real move started I didn't know this was gonna happen in defiance exactly this way but you can imagine that there were not a lot of people that were bullish here because again it just looks like a failed rally didn't take out the prior highs or whatever didn't do that here either uh, and I made a comment on Twitter that I, I'm think, I think we're closer to this second leg up in juniors than we are to a lower low. And that's obviously, as, as a value investor, I don't care. Because it's so cheap already. So it's like, I don't care if this is a false breakdown. Because from a value investor's perspective, there's no way this is a selling point anyway. And this is kind of what happened. So it retraced. Then, uh, like here, like here, then boom. Insane volumes. It ripped like 200% in, I don't know how short of a time period. Now it's actually retraced back. Now the price is down here. So this is extreme volatility. And you can see that here as well. It's like, goes up, chops, goes down, up, retrace, up, retrace a lot, retraces a lot, up, retraces, up, retraces, up. Uh, stalls out, starts going again, pretty big correction, up again, pretty big correction, up again, pretty big correction, up again. It's, it's uh, The volatility is just absolutely insane. Anybody who thinks, and I think a lot of people believe that, oh, since we're, we might have started a bull market. Uh, let's see here from the lows here. Oh yeah, 550% from the lows. This is what I'm talking about. Just like that, from out of nowhere, down here, nobody believed there could even be another rally in junior, so nobody bought. Boom, 550%. On what? Well, sentiment, uh, sentiment has returned. In this case, they got the pull back as well. But it's like 550%, like, like that, in a few months. Everything changes all of a sudden. I've seen it before. That's why I, why I kept saying, it's like, nope, perma buy, perma buy you know stock picking but this is we're way 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 past the point of selling way point of, uh, past the point of uh, timing the bottom how many actually didn't time the bottom i mean most people do now we're seeing a lot of people starting to get interested in 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 juniors and silver juniors and all that why because now they're going up that's how it works and the momentum is just going to feed on itself Regardless what the companies actually did or did not do. And uh, I recently recorded a KU report on the topic. Um, here you can see we're at the highest price point since. Okay, so maybe in like 12 years. Yeah, 11, 12 years now. Uh, <clears throat> the topic was or what I tried to convey. I don't know if I did a good job. Is that even in, and especially that goes for juniors, I mean, 2016 was the most epic rally in juniors ever, I think. Uh, but you can see, okay, goes up, retraces, up, retraces, up a bit, churn, churn, retraces, up a bit, retraces. I mean, didn't go that far. I mean, the, not a big price difference from April 18th to... 8th of June. So almost two months over like, you know, choppy action. Boom. Starts to chop again. Boom, boom. Retraces. Boom. So my point is prepare already for the fact that, yes, on Friday, everybody was happy. Most juniors were going up. I've already, uh, already saw some people brag about their portfolio returns. On that day, whatever. Uh, one thing, you will never have the best performing portfolio, especially not on Twitter. Everybody cherry picks, basically. Uh, and note the fact that a lot of people, as you can usually see, I mean, most people are quick to brag about trades or individual stories or even individual days in the portfolio. 
how often do you see people actually brag about their long-term returns, their entire portfolio returns in this space? I, I never see that. And I think that's saying something. I mean, if, you, if you're quick to brag about, uh, let's say, a trade or, or, or any, any given day in metals or, or one particular stock, if you're quick to brag about that, which is relatively meaningless in the grand scheme of things, because nobody knows, you could have been, you could be down 90% to start off with. You could play with, let's say, your mining portfolio is 5% of your net worth or whatever. You're just playing a few stocks. It's kind of meaningless. There, there's no context. The only thing that really matters is long-term portfolio returns. You can have a really, really good year. Uh, like we, you know, crypto people, and then you can get absolutely destroyed. So what's the important thing? It's like, how well, how good are you of creating wealth over the long term? That's the only real, ga the only important ga uh, game. Because anybody can have a good year. I mean, let, let's say you, you bought silver here, felt like a complete genius, and then this is what you got. Unless you sold here. You wrote it all the way back down, yada, yada. So it, it's almost meaningless. But that's the one thing. It's like, it's easy to get FOMO. You see people post, oh, you know, my portfolio is up this this much. Look how smart I am. I'm only into shit codes or whatever. And that's going to make people, and that's why people are going to buy more the higher it goes. Because they're seeing other people proclaiming how much they've earned, how much money they're making or, or have been making. That's going to get people to also want to make money in the same way that they see other people make money and that's why the volumes uh, go up as price goes up because people are not really good at buying low they buy whatever has been working in the recent past <clears throat> but again the thing is that uh, even in maybe I should do a daily here I mean, look at, I mean, take this for example. This is a pretty epic rally in defiance. 1,700%. 30% correction. Almost 30% correction. 30% correction. 35% correction. 23% correction, and then there's a bunch of smaller ones. I mean, here you get a, uh, well, I guess this first is 33, then you have a 20%. I mean, I, I mean, look at it. Do you think that's super easy to hold through for most people? Your position, if you were cheering, every, every top you were cheering, basically, and, and then the, uh, you're earnings rate shortly after was like oh minus 34 percent in a week then you're going to start thinking well this is the top i better sell now if, if you bought in here i better sell now before this goes to zero because if it goes down 34 percent in a week i'm going to be almost down to zero in a month right <laughs> and then it goes up and then it goes down and then it goes up and down and up and down and up and down and up so, so it's like this is kind of, especially if you're in, in more beta, this is kind of what you have to be prepared to see. It's absolutely mind-numbing, the volatility. Uh, and, and again, like I said before, most of the actual, you know, real increases in price, this is a consolidation period, basically. This was two days of up day. And then it retraced the whole way before going up. So, so, I mean, when did actually price really materially go higher? Here you have a top put in here. It's like two days candles. Already retraces. Up again, but not still not above where it traded just a few days earlier. Down again, then up. So, it's like there, there's just a few candles or days that basically... Uh, it's responsible for the brunt of the net gains over a, or, over a period of time. Most of the time it's either correcting, churning, climbing a bit. 
So it's like maybe the material gains and and they're also temporary. That's the thing. Because here you have like, okay, it uh, churns, consolidates, poof, poof, and then down all the way. So, I mean, if you're one of, or like most people, okay, uh, I'm going to... I'm going to buy on the breakout. Let's say you, you're one of those, which is basically almost everyone. Okay, here broke higher. So, so are you buying up here or are you buying down uh, down here? I mean, the close is still higher. Then you get met by a correction. Okay, then it goes up again. Okay, so you, you netted some gains if you held. But then it corrected again. So what do you do then? I cannot come up with a harder thing to do than trying to a trade this sector especially short term and even in or especially in a bull trend <laughs> um, and and not go insane or make mistakes the only person that really made a lot of money in this uptrend in defiance for example was people who didn't trade everyone else probably lost money or barely made any because like, okay, if you were, uh, I don't know, if you were down from this level, that's still, if we take this as some kind of top, that's 408%. You, you have to be really, really good at dip buying, let's say. To, to, well, you can't really beat that, but it's like, if you were able to buy every dip, yes, then things would have, uh, would work out fine. How, how easy is that to do? If you weren't bu dip buying down here, I doubt you have an easy time dip buying up here. But my point is that I want a full cycle strategy. Since I'm always net long, I don't time right. I, I don't trade in that sense. I value shuffle. If I find something that is cheaper or better prospects or better risk reward or what have you than something I already own, I'm happy to sell that. Even though I don't think it's a sell, if I find something better, I don't mind. Well, that's the point, really. I always want to feel like uh, kind of the best is yet ahead for every single stock pick. I don't play indexes. I don't bet on metals. I own physical metals, but I don't bet on... I don't buy gold futures or anything like that. So knowing how volatile this sector is, even in uptrends, and that the fact that even in an uptrend, the price, uh, there, there's countless, countless. And this was not a long rally. This was like 2000, well, March 2020. And yeah, nine months, okay? Nine months. Still, your position got cut by a third every other month, basically. How easy is that to see through? Uh, and, and then, of course, I mean, there there was other stuff like they got to Paul taken away from them. So this is a, a bit of a special case in a, in a sense. But the, the point remains. It's like it's going to be so extreme. I mean, just look at this. So it goes up like 200% from wherever. Then down 40%. So, so you imagine, oh, oh, now it's going. So you bought here. And then you might be down 20% within a day. How are you going to feel about that? Are you going to care? Are you not going to care? Whatever. Point is that, yes, let's say you actually did buy the breakout. Let's say you bought, uh, I don't know when you would have bought. I mean, let's say this is a breakout. So maybe you bought here. It went up 60, uh, 70%. Great. And probably you wouldn't dare to do that with a really big position because you're a momentum trader what have you and probably don't have a lot of money either uh, compare that to someone who just kept on averaging down you see so when the happy momentum traders punters gets in if you're if you actually were one of you who averaged down across the board in whatever your favorite juniors were you would already be up multiples of what the punter was when he's like oh i'm you know he might get in here or whatever or maybe here 67 percent i mean some of the buys down here is like 400 percent uh and I would say 
that it's a higher likelihood that the stock was going to go up, that the next big move is up from these levels than from here, for example, or especially up here. So that's what I kept saying all the time, that when we know this is a bull, and I'm, it's like, who knows if it is? I mean, up here, you know that we have been in a bull. But did you know that here? I mean, it wasn't over these kind of highs even. Up here, everybody was convinced it's a bull. Then it's too late. Down here, everybody and their mother could see it's a bear market. That's when you should be buying. Really. So it's like... I would, I mean, Defiance is probably a beta alpha play. I mean, I I was fortunate enough to, to have some money and be in a private placement recently. Uh, and, and the holding period is still up, so I can't even trade this. I've just been watching in awe that the volumes basically exploded and it ramped like crazy. But I can't even, you know, trade it. And of course, the portfolio side or the portfolio position has gone up. But it's like, how much has... The value of the company gone up. I mean, there hasn't been re any real news. So if my portfolio position goes up 3x, uh, uh, should I, you know, be buying more? I mean, if this was a pure trading sardine, you would be scaling out. But now people are getting into these juniors. They didn't dare to buy down here. Now, anybody who actually... Average down has a lot of you know uh, more margin to play with if you know what I mean. Let's say it goes down here, or maybe goes down there, and then starts going up, or goes up to more whatever. It's like if if you've been able to put take your average down a lot, it's like you're you're playing with house money as soon as the breakout comes. Whereas most other people, they're getting exposure as soon as the breakout happens and then they're buying in they again that's what i kept saying it's like either you either you want to make money or look smart because you almost can't do both you're going to look dumb if you average down in a bear trend you might look smart for a while if you you know it's the super momentum oh you buy in here and you catch this move but by that time the average the the person who's been averaging down and who's been looking stupid for maybe two three years even uh he's got, he would be up a shit ton so you might have a hundred percent trading um was like oh i'm you know i don't have six months where i'm not in the green let's say short and this person might have years of being in the red but he's gonna be making more money around the tops than than the one with a hundred percent quote hit rate that's the thing but a lot of the, but the markets are a lot about ego and uh, people not being able to trust their conviction because they don't really know what they have. They don't really know. know they don't have a strategy. My strategy, and I've been very open about this, 80% of the time I look stupid, kind of. 20% of the time I make a lot of money. Uh, if we're just talking, you know, cyclicality. Um, so if you have to look smart all the time, if you can't stand, uh, you know, someone ask, oh, did you make money this year? It's like, no, not really. Oh, okay, then then you think that he thinks you're very bad at this. And then two years of that. And it's like, oh, this is getting untenable. Uh, can't even be at the Christmas dinner without someone asking me. And it's like, I remember this from poker, where it's like when you, when you had bad variance, as we call it. For some reason, I mean, I'm not going to say luck, because you, you're not supposed to win every time you have the best hand but whatever if you had a long streak of losing important pots even if you were a favorite you knew you played well but you lost the big ones where you were a favorite when you were you know happy to put in a lot of money and you had a streak of them go the wrong way you could have you could have a even if you were a winning player you could have months where you were actually losing money or, or trading uh, even in the stock market, you don't play, you know, thousands of hands per day. You don't play thousands of picks per day. So in 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 uh, investing, you might, you know, oh, I own 30 stocks and they were all down for two years. I mean, in, in over two years, if you played poker, you would play probably 
maybe hundreds, hundreds of thousands of hands, and it would even out by that time. But in 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 uh, stock market, it can be much more clunky, and and especially in the sentiment driven sector like this, it's like it's almost rigged against you, and then it's rigged for you. You can't make any nothing you do looks smart or right, and then everything you do looks smart and right. Nothing looks smart and right, then all of a sudden everything you hold looks like a good buy, etc. Uh, so, okay, what to do? Because I think a lot of people have never, uh, I think a lot of my followers, let's say, have never seen a bull because a lot of people got into, well, maybe saw the last stage of a bull in 2020 because I think a lot of people got in around this time, uh, around around this time so now it's like okay what do you do i mean a lot of people have already said that oh you know i'm gonna sell as soon as i get my money back of course that's what they say when it actually gets going and they feel like oh this is so easy i think actually people are gonna press the bet if they're still around i hope some people are still around because that's felt like 80 percent of my time over the last one, two years especially has just been trying to get people to not sell low and actually average down because, as I've said, there's a 100% chance that we were going to get a rally. But if you listen to the Twitter experts and the 95% of people who are, you know, feel free to give other people advice, they're going to say it's very iffy. And this sector could be dead for years to come. We never know. And then you hear, oh, but the dilution and yada, 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 yada. Well, the fines diluted. They did a financing and it still went up like three, four hundred percent. So there you have it. I mean, if you take this sector too seriously, I've said that as well. Uh, you're going to go insane and you're missing the entire point. This is a very stupid sector. Because there's people in it and people do a lot of stupid stuff. Um so right now with silver ripping everybody's posting about silver and they they post in uh, you know pictures of of their uh, whatever holding they have it's up 20 percent it's up 30 percent i mean obviously they want to look smart they want to get even more people to buy it yada yada it's like i'm not saying i'm, I'm not, i've never done that or never gonna do that but you get where it's coming from uh what's that gonna create fomo of course it's like even on Friday, it's not like my portfolio is up 30%. Most of the stocks were up, but maybe, you know, average 5 6%. And in the grand scheme of things, which I say all the time, it's like maybe we have, uh, you know, X there's like 250 trading days per year. If we have a four-year horizon, I mean, if we're going to be, if we're going to be investing for, let's say, 12 years, at least 12, 12 years that's 3000 market days what does it matter what the portfolio did on any one day that's one in a uh, one three thousandth uh, of the journey if you know what i mean so who cares if portfolio is up five percent today it could be down five percent tomorrow it was it, it's what the net gain is after those let's say three thousand market days in a row that's when it's important. Unless you plan on selling the very day, it, you know, oh, it's up 5%. I'm going to take my winnings and leave. It's like, I don't think the junior sector is uh, near a major high. Short term, who knows what can happen. I mean, we saw that all the time. Retracement, retracement. Uh, but uh, I'm going off topic, I guess. But uh, my point is that I, I, I have... Let's say created my strategy that I don't. You know, I'm not supposed to need trading, like technical analysis or, or market timing. Okay, and I also built my portfolio, or I'm invested in this space because I think we might have a coming bull market. And if you listen to Felix Sulaus, he thinks commodities will do well for the rest of this entire decade. That's six years. So a few things, I need to be able to write out volatility and I'm a value investor and I think the stocks I own, I think are cheap still. Okay, so there's no selling because they're too cheap. 
But I also, again, want to write out the volatility. What, is, what helps with that? Well, first of all, if you're bullish on a particular company, if you're convinced, like, oh, in two years, this company could be worth two, three times what it's worth today. So you're greedy about two years from now all the time relative to the current price. So if the current price goes down 20%, but you're living in two years from now where you think, oh, Jesus, it's, you know, it's going to be worth two, three times what's, what the project is worth today. That's going to probably get you to not sell and maybe even buy more if the dip uh, comes around. How do you do that with a pure trading sardine where you think, oh, I don't even like this project particularly. I don't really see the value. Uh, I don't think this project is going to get built. Nobody's really going to want it. Um, no. Where's the conviction going to come from? Maybe if your conviction in the bull, in, in that the silver is going to go to $100 within two years, that might be enough to actually dip by the beta, uh, the trading sardines. Fine. That's one way to do it. Of course, in that case, you kind of have to be right. That's the problem. But if you actually bought something with, let's say, pretty tangible value or has a shot of getting tangible value, you think you underpaid for it. Problem solved. Yes, it doesn't mean you're going to make money, <clears throat> especially in a particular time frame. But if you think you bought something real for much less than it was worth, then you've already won. Then the only thing to wait, do is wait, suffer through the volatility until you think the price is fair or it's not. Yeah, I mean, it's not cheap anymore. Or you find something cheaper, whatever. So if you constantly look beyond today, tomorrow, and you live in, you know, one, two years from now, and you focus on the specific companies and you think they have real value, that's going to get you to stay the course. Hopefully, it depends on, I mean, if you don't have any dry powder, let's say silver goes like that. Uh, which, which are the ones that's probably going to do the best? Maybe pure trading sardines. And when we have weeks like this, obviously people get excited by trading sardines because they're the ones that have actually gone up the most. But that's the thing. What, what are they going to do when volatility hits? If I have conviction in my picks, if I think... The fine silver is worth a dollar. I'm convinced of it. Not saying that I'm absolutely right, but that's what my due diligence has led me to believe. Then it's just a matter in that case, like, okay, how much should it be up one day? Let's say within two years, I think it's going to, you know, reach my fair value. Then it's just a matter of, okay, how much am I going to make, if you know what I mean? So if up here, oh, maybe just 87% of returns left. Down here, it's up to 217 again. Is that, if I have conviction in that, is, am I going to sell low? No, I'm probably going to buy more. Maybe sell a bit when it goes up. Because all of a sudden, now you think the opportunity cost is that, oh, I know other juniors that have a 200% expected returns. And I only think the finance is 87. Then that's where value shuffling comes in. So it's like it's a more of a natural. It's like when people ask me when to sell. I have no idea when to sell. I don't have target prices or anything like that. I just want the companies to be, even if I'm 50% off, that I think it's, um, I think it's worth here. But it's like even if it's worth just 50 from this price, well, there's still upside. You know what I mean? And if I think it can grow, it's like, oh, let's say I have this as a base case, but I think the growth curve is going to be like that. Then I'm going to be paid to wait. That keeps me in the long game. That's why I always want or typically want there to be probable and high potential growth for the next few years. That makes that gives me staying power. And preferably, I would ob obviously want the price to be uh, under that value. I mean, it sh should be cheap. Sure, there's some very, let's say, high growth potential story where it's like maybe price is up here. And this is what they have confirmed so far. But you think that the growth pace is so rapid that if you're right, uh, it's just a matter of time before you're going to be in the green from the price you paid. Uh, but uh, that's uh, one thing I think, like, think about this.
play, play it out in your head. How are you going to react? It's like what Napoleon said. You should know what to do if the, or, uh, if the enemy army shows up in your front, your rear, or either, your, uh, either of your flanks. You should already know how you're going to respond. And do you have a strategy that takes in all different scenarios, kind of, and, and works um, well in ad, uh, any type of scenario? I mean, nobody knows all the scenarios. That's not what I mean, but I hope you get the point. Nothing could, should come as a shock. I mean, if, if you're one of those where it's like, oh, Friday silver was up a lot. Today silver is up a lot. Then you just jump head in first in any, any silver union you find with silver in its name that somebody's you know, promoting, let's say, on Twitter. So you just buy and it's like, oh, it goes up 10% after you bought it. You, your portfolio is up and you get all you know, crazy. It's like, whoa, uh, easy, how easy it is. Okay, then you get your first minus 30% correction. Do you have a plan for what to do? Or, or are you going to be thinking like, oh, sh shit, it's this. And now people are saying that silver is going to, because let's say it coincides with silver going down. Silver goes down to 28. And then you're going to see on Twitter target prices of 26, 24, whatever. People don't sell because something is down that day. People sell because they think it's going to go down tomorrow. That's the same reason why people buy today if it's up. They think it's going to go up tomorrow. What happens if it doesn't? Do you have a strategy? Can you mentally handle the volatility? Or will you just be, you know... Uh, um, you know, a headless chicken, basically. Okay, yeah, it's easy to buy when it's up and it goes up the next day in two days, but then it retraces. What are you going to do then? Even if, even if we assume, it's like, oh, metals are going to have a bull market for the rest of the decade. Imagine how many corrections will be in that bull market. Uh, let's see if we can pull up just a Huey, maybe. Okay, it doesn't go back further than that. Okay. So, too bad, but look at the volatility. It's insane. So my point is, I guess, again, I'm trying to help here. I hope I'm, I don't know, able to get my points across. But it's like, my default is that we're in a long-term bull market in metals. That doesn't mean the metals, that doesn't mean gold can't go down to 2,100 or 2,000. That doesn't mean silver can retrace to whatever, $25 or even below that. Who knows? That copper can have a washout. Anything can happen. Over the longer term, I think we're in a bull market. That, that's why I'm, you know, 100% long. So then the question is, how do I make sure I'm a part of it? Well, if you pick the, let's say, companies that are cheap and actually can grow, it doesn't really matter. We've seen companies buck the trend. Um, good example would be Snowland Gold. And there's other uh, exploration companies in different metals that have bucked the trend. That even when the sector was down, they actually went uh, either traded kind of flat or actually went up. Or lost less share price than the sector. Then when the next upturn comes, you make it all back and then some. So if you get the companies right, it doesn't really matter even. Uh, I mean, in the end, you're going you're gonna to make money anyway. That's the point. But a bull market in metals and increasing sentiment, that would be a bonus, kind of. Because if a stock you think is worth this, it's trading here, sentiment goes down. But actually, the value, it was worth this, but two years from now, it's worth this much. So even if sentiment went down this much, 
and the value increased as much as the sentiment went down, then the net is kind of flat curve. So maybe the price is here. If it if it didn't hadn't created value, the price would be here. If uh, sentiment didn't go down, price would be up here. But so even in uh, you know let's say sentiment got really really bad, just kept on going down. You would maybe be flat until the next turn when sentiment keeps increasing. Let's say they continue to grow. Yeah, okay. If that continues to grow, sentiment gets better. Whatever. Maybe value is up here two years down the road again, and sentiment has increased so much now it's tri trading over the actual value. So then the share price action was kind of flat. Okay, let's have it like that. Flat, and then all of a sudden, boom. So yeah, you didn't look too smart, but you were smart. You didn't know the sentiment was going to go in the crapper. But in the end, it doesn't even matter because you know sentiment is going to change. That's the only two knowns we know at any time. Price we pay for something and the sentiment always changes. So that's, in my opinion, a good way to basically uh, set yourself up to not lose over the longer term. Because... It doesn't take a rocket scientist to know it's going to be hard to make money over these four years if you bought up in here. If you average down and have done that for multiple cycles and you have actually you know, put yourself in companies that have created value on average, not every single company, but on average. So you keep on ramping up your buying at every low and let's say the uh, growth curve of your companies on average has at least kept growing. You probably would be in the green now already. And if we go to this high, you're probably gone. You're, you're, if, let's say, the finance goes up here or whatever, let's say a trading starting goes up here, your returns are probably up here. So you're outperforming the sector in that case because the sector sucks on average and most things are trading earnings. That's how I keep my head in the game. That's why I keep can buy low that's why i don't need to do i mean that's the beauty right now for example it's like now people are might have been on the fence line or you know on the fence and it's like oh should i buy in is it a go time is it whatever if you're just good at buying low it doesn't matter it doesn't matter if this was the go time it doesn't matter if it if it retraced down here you would only just buy more because assuming it's just cheaper and then we have, you know, or, or even if, I don't think that's the case, but let's say it goes like that, then that's the final low. Because some some of these lows, or one of these lows are going to be the final low. This looks like this was the final low. So now people have a hard time like, okay, you know, is the bull, is the bull market on? Is the bull market off? Whatever. Uh, and I can understand that that's a bit sweaty. But again, if, if you just put down to every low, it's like, you know you're gonna win. It's just a matter of time. And when people make hard decisions like figuring out when this is actually a bull market, uh, it's like, okay, w what uh, level has to be broken when this is a bull market? Maybe here, oh, okay, it goes up. And they make a bit of money. In the meantime, you had all the time in the world to just get in cheaper, cheaper, cheaper. Full positions across the board, if uh, even in the low liquidity juniors where it could take weeks or months, you're gonna be up a shit ton. And again, when this guy is, might be nervous to, you know, oh, I'm, you know, is this a bull? Can I ma start making money now? Y you're already making a lot of money. It would maybe again, it's like even if you didn't do an, a single buy, if your average is down here. Some other pe person buys up here. I mean, it would take, it, it would need to top and go back all the way down here before maybe the, or maybe down here actually, before this guy that just averaged down was neutral again. In the meantime, the guy that waited for the bull bought in here. If he stuck around for that long, long up here, uh, he would be, you know, in, in 
series red here already would have be absolutely destroyed here so the only the, the best offense and defense is being able to buy low because then all the upside is basically free optionality and of course like right now there are stocks that have run so much that they might have been cheap i don't think they're super cheap just from what's happened in last one two months but I think there are stocks out there that are still super duper cheap. So for me, it's easy. It's like some of these, maybe one should have taken profits on Defiance. I don't know what the actual uh, market cap came up to. Let's say 130 million. Is that expensive or not? I mean, nobody of course knows, but maybe there are other stuff that's even cheaper. Maybe there's stuff out there that you think like, hey, I think this is going to go up four or 500% relatively easily just to get back to fair value. Could one say the same of the fine silver up here that, oh, four or 500% more is like piece of cake. I don't know if, you know, half a billion in market cap is that of a no brainer for defiance, if you know what I mean. But some stocks that might be down to whatever, it's like, can you see them go up four or five times from the lows right now or from the prices right now? Yeah, I can see that in some companies. Then it's much easier to just stay the course. If you can continuously think that every single holding you have is a buy and it's undervalued based on the two, two year time frame, then you're just going to stick it out. That's why it's like, and like I've said before, I can suffer a lot of corrections because I'm all, always, so far since 2015, I'm 100% exposed from the lows. And I increase my buying the lower it goes. Plus stock picking, plus value shuffling. So I'm, I'm, I mean, on one hand, yes, I want to arm wave and have, you know, people like, oh, come into the junior sector, let's flood in. Because yes, they're obviously going to buy up my companies as well. But that's not really what this is about. I'm trying to like teach, let's say. A strategy that's pretty simple or pretty simple I think it's supposed to be as simple as can be but it makes total sense stock picking value investing folks on the companies themselves treat sentiment changes in the positive sense treat price metal changes in the positive sense as bonuses not requirements it's going to be harder when we go up to a real sentiment high kind of real euphoria i mean this is like yeah n now we're in the juniors we probably have some short-term euphoria in a sense but i don't think the the, <laughs> the average per person is not in the junior sector yet that I can kind of, that I think is 100% true. So we're not, I mean, we're not even close to, you know, 2011 highs at least. Uh, we can see that on Orca, even though, yeah, it's, you, can't, you can't just compare this to this, obviously. But this was from what I have heard, true euphoric, a true euphoric period. Everybody was talking about miners. I don't think everybody's talking about miners right now, especially not juniors. It doesn't take a lot of money to bid up these juniors. Just think about the fact that Dogecoin still probably has a market cap of $15 billion. And that crypto has like $2.5 trillion in market cap. If 5% of that came in the junior sector, mining sector, everything would be up in the stratosphere. So I don't think we're even close to some kind of long-term bubble type euphoria. Just because we've had one, two, one to two month upturn. But of course, there's going to be a lot of top callers. 
of course like always but that's again the thing if i'm on average right on the companies and i pay a cheap price from when i got in then the risks are going to be to the upside well i mean in a sense on average so that's how i'm gonna stay in the game i'm not gonna i'm gonna try to not just fomo into every silver beta junior simply because it looks like silver is uh, gonna rip or whatever and that might happen maybe in hindsight maybe silver well yeah maybe in hindsight we know that silver did this and one should be 100 percent in silver juniors beta place right now but that's again a strategy can't just rely on if statements if you know what i mean my portfolio is never going to be the best performing one in a bull i don't think it's just that over time instead of going like this it tends to go like this but with a lot of ups and downs in in between I have some silver juniors. My po large position is a private silver junior. But I like copper. I think gold juniors are cheaper than silver juniors still. Anything that is cheap. I own some silica for Christ's sake. I own nickel, PGMs. Anything that I think is cheap is by default a buy as a value investor and i'd rather be pretty right than exactly wrong if i go all in on one theme one type of company beta you're only set up for this rip let's say what hap what if that doesn't happen what if we go up a bit it it falls over and the junior sell off hard Again, what are you going to do that? And then maybe we zigzag for a while before going up. Meanwhile, the beta slash alpha place might have created more value. So they keep climbing. Yada, yada. The best performing portfolio is going to be the... I'm not going to say that. That's hard to say. But the best performing stocks typically are the highest beta ones if we go into almost a straight euphoric rise in metals but that's the thing they also give it all back on the other side of the inflection point i'm i'd rather make sure to make money than gamble in everything on timing and uh, yeah the greater fool theory And who knows, maybe copper is going to surprise. Maybe gold is going to surprise. And if gold units are already the cheapest, then they are, by default, probably the best buys. That doesn't mean juniors, silver juniors or junior silvers cannot outperform it. It, means, it doesn't mean that copper can't outperform it, but it doesn't mean either that maybe copper... Copper is putting in a top. Maybe we go into recession. Maybe a recession takes silver down a bit. Maybe gold does well when the other ones don't do well. Or maybe copper and silver outperforms. Again, I have no idea. Nobody really knows. You can just look on Twitter how many people have, I mean, proclaimed uh, junior bear markets here. Now it's a bull here. What happens tomorrow? I don't know. Nobody knows. As Bob Moriarty likes to say. I'm already getting long in the tooth here. I was going to cover some other stuff. But I will say though that. Uh, take Red Pine for example. Uh, so Red Pine. I mean this is has turned into some something of a shit show. Uh, did the gold disappear no uh i think they might see a 10 to 20 percent haircut in in 
the stated resource or something. So it's like, is there gold at the Wawa Gold Project? Of course there is. Is red pine expensive or cheap? I mean, it's only 18 million CAD. Maybe if the next true resource shows that, hey, we have, let's say, 1.5 to 2 million ounces. This is obviously going to look pretty cheap, especially if those are pretty good ounces. So this is, like always, investing in Schrodinger's cat. If all kind of works out, and this Vava Gold project, they keep working it, keeps getting bigger, maybe in two years they have three to four million ounces, then of course this is going to look really cheap. But what if there's like, I don't know, class action lawsuits? What if there's some legal stuff that hangs over? What if whatever the ounces in the ground are not that economic? Yeah, yeah. It's like nobody knows what's exactly going to happen. I don't know. I'm not an expert on... I'm not a lawyer. I try to avoid the... Let's say hard questions. So I did dip by on the, I think it was the first day it fell when it crashed this candle here. Uh, but I actually sold some again, or I sold quite a bit. It's like my two cents, and this is just me. This might, in a year or two from now, this might be the best performing gold junior stock out there. Who knows? Uh, the, there's gold there. There's probably a few million ounces of gold there. Uh, this looks cheap. Obviously, it looks cheap. But it's like there's some stuff again, legal, what have you, that I don't know how to quantify or qualify, or on a qualitative basis. Uh, what if what if the sector gets going, but there's some you know. Uh, uh, you know, class action lawsuit kind of hanging over like a cloud on this story. Will that get p people to buy it up? I don't know. My point is that if if we were at a more of a real sentiment high and, and the only like probably cheap stores you could find would be like special cases like this where something uh, <laughs> very weird happened. That's a net negative, but it's, you know, price went down so much that it's like, hey, I mean, everything else is like fairly or overvalued. This is the best chance I have of buying something that could turn out to be really cheap. Then Red Pine would be even more attractive. But it's like my two cents, how I'm feeling is like, I don't want to need to be kept up to date on all the shenanigans that's going to come out of this. Maybe so. So what I'm saying is that I'm not I'm not averaging down. Uh, I've actually, I mean, positions got destroyed, obviously. Then I averaged down a bit. Then I sold a bit uh, when it went up. As we get more news, and this looked to turn into a much more jungle type scenario than I expected. Uh, yeah. So I, I guess what I'm saying is that. I'm in no rush to dip by red pine simply because I, I think there are more straightforward stories out there that yes, this might turn out to be really, really cheap and everybody who dip bought here, you know, a lot. Maybe they're sitting on the best performing stock over the next one to two years in the gold space. Who knows? I'm just saying. I don't think there's no shortage of opportunities out there. So if I, let's say this has, a, I'm just going to throw numbers out there. Let's say this has an expected value of like 400%. Expected return of 400%. In a good market, you know, let's say we bull keeps going or 500%. If I find some other more straightforward cases where I don't need to 
be up to date what happens on a law from a law standpoint. Um, maybe, and they might have an expected returns of three hundred percent. Maybe that's okay. Because it's not, it's not the kind of situation where it's like I absolutely know what's going to happen, and I know this is going to turn out to be really, really cheap, and I'm like, I'm putting 20% of my portfolio in this. That's not one of these situations for me. I have no idea what's actually going to play out here. I think it's cheap, but again, I think there might be stuff happening. Or again, who knows? Maybe Alamos Gold buys them in within six months, and you get a 100% premium. Nobody knows. That's my point. And I don't know anything. I don't know what I'm going to make on any single story I own. And I don't know if I sell a story how much I'm going to lose out on. Nobody knows. We're all taking educated bets, guesstimates. Based on information we know. Based on how we function as investors. And based on what other things we could buy for that money. So I will, I mean, as it looks now, I'm probably gonna maybe be all out of Red Pine shortly. And that might again end up to be a massive mistake in hindsight. That's why you have to know or I should say, any, everybody has to make up their own decisions, decision on what to buy or what to sell. And it should fit your psychological profile, yada yada. If you don't know other story that you think is as cheap as this, maybe to you that's a buy then. But at least one should, I guess, be aware that's like, there might be class action lawsuits. I'm not saying there's going to be, I think there's been talk of it. Maybe that's going to happen. Okay, how does that factor into it? I don't even want to read up on what happens uh, in terms of whatever, share performance with class action losses. Maybe it's going to turn out to be a nothing burger. But do I need to stick around to find that out? I don't think so. Uh so yeah, I mean, this is the, I guess the, I mean, the, from a percentage standpoint, this is obviously one of the worst performers over the last six months. Funny thing is like Condor, I lost a shit ton on that, but hey, that was visible risk. I was happy to take the risk. Red Pine, I actually thought it was one of the safer ones. Because, you know, they got Elemos Gold, they got Franco Nevada. They have a resource already, brownfield exploration in a gold camp in Wawa, Canada. And then this happens, which caught everybody completely off guard. So I don't regret investing. I mean, it was a top 10 position in most family portfolios, but it still was around, I think, 4% maybe. So it's not, not a disaster, you know, minus 2% in the portfolio, perhaps. Um, uh, but I guess it goes to show at least as like this is, uh, you know, s one of the merits of diversification. Because there's stuff we don't even know about. Yeah, I guess that's it um, for now. Uh, I, I guess I could also say yes that it's like <laughs> in terms of copper, I think copper is a lot harder than gold and silver to judge the projects. That's why I'm mostly actually in in uh, copper explorers. Even though like right now you see the major miners, they're buying copper mines. Uh, it's just that I don't really know. I I I, I pre if I play pure beta I prefer to play it in gold and silver uh, if I'm not play if I'm playing beta and copper I have a hard time 
judging the quality of copper products much harder for me than gold products or silver products uh, so that's why I don't typically like to play that angle and um, and uh, what was I gonna say no so it's more of the to the expiration side of things I mean it's like hand and metals majors involved inflection resources majors involved kingfisher metals not majors involved but it's like I think it has a market cap of seven eight million pre financing Kodiak already has um, not a resource but already has um, uh, uh, already has like success let's say uh, up at the man prime area and they have a bunch more targets and they have tech involved uh, yeah so it's like again I know they're not pricing in having any kind of copper mines that's worth anything so I'm okay with like maybe the chance of success is like 20-30% for some of these but they're so cheap that it makes worth it if you diversify the company risk by that I don't mean like oh I'm gonna put 20% of my portfolio in hand and metals because they might have a porphyry district no I'm thinking like hey a percent or two across the board in some of these the few that actually end up making a significant discovery maybe they're gonna go and 10 bag 20 bag 30 bag uh, so that's how i'm playing the copper theme whereas in gold i'm more into developers or advanced explorers you know first and order kind of stuff and the same goes for actually copper and nickel pgms with magna for example uh yeah i hope you get something out of this i think the main thing was just that uh, again we might be in a newborn bull market in the junior space and this might be new to a lot of people so you have to basically figure out how to suffer through stuff like this getting getting blindsided every other week by 30% corrections and make that work yeah thanks for listening bye